Hi, this is Caroline from The Happy Sensitive, and in this video I want to unravel something a little bit complicated with you around victim blaming and how do you deal with narcissists and what is the right attitude. Okay, and when we deal with narcissism and narcissists and, you know, like how to heal from that, you very end up in discussions around victim blaming. And I really want to dive into that because it's, I think it's really misunderstood and there's a lot of people who do a lot of either or with it and then it's not helpful. Okay. So the complicated thing in dealing with narcissists is that there needs to be a point where you say, no, no, this is not okay. No, this behavior cannot be excused. It doesn't matter what happened to them as a kid. It doesn't matter how bad they feel. It doesn't matter. Like all the things like you got to say, you got to draw a line and say, this is not acceptable. Period. I don't care what, I don't need to hear the story. This is just not acceptable. This is not how you treat people, right? And for those of uh, for those of you who are kind of like skeptical about that, think about someone who went through hell as a kid, as an adult, who had all these horrible experiences and who still continues to be a nice human being, a caring, compassionate human being, okay? That is possible, okay? So from that perspective, certain things are just not okay and they're not... We don't have to excuse them. We don't have to say yes, but, or, and we definitely don't have to say, oh, but poor them, they have a personality disorder. You just gotta say, so certain things you gotta not tolerate in your life and say, those, those, those things are not acceptable. Okay, so um, people who uh, are very adamant about trying to prevent victim blaming, they got that stuff figured out, right? They're like, okay, this, this is really not okay. It doesn't matter why or how, and it's not our fault and we didn't do anything. They are doing this and that's not okay. And they're right about that. That is definitely true. But when, when you're on your healing journey, there's also a further place to go with this, where you gotta, you gotta both say, this behavior is not okay and I'm not standing for it. You do this to me, I walk out. You do this to me, I leave. You do this to me, I'm no longer your friend. You gotta be willing to go there. But at the same time, if that's the only thing you're doing, you're missing out and you're missing a huge piece of the puzzle because there is some kind of weird attraction that often happens between very narcissistic and very compassionate people, very cold and insensitive people and very highly sensitive people. There is this interesting dynamic that happens and why is that? Sometimes it's like almost like polar opposites that attract, right? And you could say, well, the narcissists just have to work on themselves, but they're, you know, they're never going to. That's part of what, that's part of what being a narcissist is. It's believing that you're perfect, that everyone else is wrong and you don't have to do any inner work and you have never have to change. And even believing that change is not possible. That's, I think that's a cop out, but it's this idea like, I am just the way I am. You just have to accept me how I are, how I, how I am, you know? And that's, that's a very narcissistic way of, of dealing with life. So don't wait for the narcissist to go to therapy, okay? <laughs> they're not going to. And if they do, they're probably just gonna pick up some new ways to manipulate you because they're not convinced that they need change at all. That's part of their inner mindset is that they're perfect and everything they don't like, they just push away. I did a different video on that, so I'm not gonna go into that here. Um, but yes, it's important to not blame the victim and not say, well, you just like attracted this into your life. And if you had been different, they wouldn't behave this way. No, like narcissistic people have shitty behaviors. That's not okay, period, right? But on the other side of that, you, you gotta look into like, why did you fall for them? And why did you get taken in by them? And yeah, of course, there's some skill and manipulation on their end for sure. And there's a gradual buildup, right? But there's also blind spots on our end. There's blind spots like, I just believe that if I would just love him enough, he would change or it would be okay. Or I thought I could fix the relationship by myself. I didn't think they needed to be involved or I just, they told me who they were, but I didn't really believe it. You know, there's, there's elements in there that have to do with our own inner work around what were we blind to? What were we naive about? What didn't we see? And this is where, when you start talking about those topics, there are people who come out of the woodwork to yell your victim blaming, right? When you start talking about these ways that narcissists and very empathic people can interact and be attracted to each other, suddenly you're victim blaming, but that's not it. And that's why this is a very delicate, more complicated topic because you need to have both, right? Because if you're on this other side where you're only doing your inner work, you're only looking at yourself, you're only looking at what did I do, it does turn into victim blaming and it does become a very dangerous endeavor in a way because what happens when people do that 
is they stay in dangerous situations and they endlessly do healing work on themselves. And I've seen this and it's sometimes something you can't do anything about because when someone has decided they want to stay and they want to make it work, they're going to do whatever they can. And you know, people can take this to, extre to the extreme where they just take all the blame. They just take all the blame because they're like, I will work on myself. I will try to make myself be a person that can handle all of this. And if I can't handle it, I just have to be tougher and stronger and meditate more and heal more and do all these things. That is a really dangerous place to go to, right? So that with this discussion of how do you heal from and deal with narcissistic relationships, there's these two extremes. You can go into they're horrible people, it's all on them. Or you can go into, I just have too many wounds and it's all on me. And they're both problematic. Because if you're constantly focused on how bad they are, you're going to run into the same problem over and over again, again because you're not looking at what's happening on the inside. You're not looking at, you're not aware of and focused on what was it in me that gave them a hold over me, that allowed them to manipulate me. Because there's always something, right? Like let's say for example that we've got this horrible person in the neighborhood who is manipulating women with ice cream, okay? Like he just goes around from door to door and he's like, he's gonna offer you ice cream and it's like really good ice cream and then you're like, you take a risk you shouldn't and you go with them even though you shouldn't, you know. If I didn't like ice cream, that person would have no hold over me. But it's because I'm like, oh, what kind of ice cream is it? And like, tell me more. And like, you know, I'm, now I'm interested, right? So if I understand that I have a, a vulnerability when it comes to ice cream, I can be a little bit more alert. I can be like, okay, wait a minute. I know I have this thing for ice cream and he's saying all these things and he makes it sound really good, but reality check, I don't know him. So let's just go to the store instead and get my own ice cream. Something I could do very simply, right? Or let's say that the ice cream was an unhealthy craving. That would be something I could dig into deeper. Like, why do I crave this ice cream? What is this ice cream trying to replace, like, or intended to replace inside of me? What, what hole is it trying to fill? What is that hole about? What am I really needing? What is really going on there? Either way, there's ways to make sure that when the ice cream man comes, you're not gonna just like run along with him, right? And so narcissists are very good at finding your point like your places where you can be manipulated and they're always one step ahead of you so if you want to avoid getting dragged into unhealthy dynamics with narcissists you got to do that inner work to realize ah this is where they hook me this is how they manipulate me this is what they promise maybe not explicitly but implicitly that I'm really craving but I never realized I was craving it so that's why I went along with it and that's why I was blind to what was happening often when we're blind to what's happening we're not 100% blind we're just tuning something out because that thing that we on some level do sense is either too scary to look at too scary or overwhelming or it's just a reality we don't really want to acknowledge we're like no this is going to destroy the happy dream i don't want to see it right so there's, oh, there's there's stuff like that going on and that is not victim blaming that is taking responsibility for your life and yourself and it's self-empowerment um but of course it can turn into victim blaming when it becomes the woman who is in a 30 year relationship with a very abusive narcissist and she just stays put and she, stays, she keeps doing work on herself and she keeps going to spiritual workshops and she keeps meditating. And then every time she does that, she feels a little bit better and she feels like she can cope just a little bit longer and she can stay just another week. And you know, and like she's, she's filled up with love again so she can hang, hang out another few days with her horrible partner. And you know, I just keep, keep going through that cycle. It's like she's drowning and then she's floating and she's drowning and she's floating and she's drowning and she's floating. That is really unhealthy. And that is definitely what can happen when you kind of go into the victim blaming side, which is like, it's all on me. I have to do all the work and there's no boundaries. Boundaries are so important. It's like, there's always a sliding scale. It's always like, I'm just trying to understand. I'm just trying to learn from this. I'm just trying to do my inner work. And there's no sense of when somebody does this, I'm out. I don't care why it is. I don't care what the reasons are. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what I have to do. I'm out. Um, I was in this years ago and I was in this kind of group therapy thing when I had my burnout in, so, so it must've been like 2009, 10 ish somewhere. And um, there was a woman in the group who, ha who was in an unhappy relationship, like really unhappy. And that was one of the reasons that she was exhausted and burned out because she was dealing with this relationship where she was just, you know, she was married and, but then when it came down to it, 
And this is something that's for me is really hard to wrap my mind around because I would rather go and I don't know, I, 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 would, I would pick another alternative. But for me, it was really hard to, to understand this. She, she said, if I leave him, I am giving up my luxurious lifestyle. I'm giving up the car, I'm giving up the clothes, I'm giving up the jewelry, the nice dinners, and I don't want to do that, so I'm going to stay with him. Right? So in that situation, she is not a victim, okay? She is choosing to stay. And no amount of whining and bitching about her husband in that case is okay because she is making a trade-off and quite consciously as well, right? And so there's, that's, I mean, that's the other side of, um, what can happen when someone's only focused on like their hor the horrible other person? The other person's so horrible. Yeah, but what are your options? What are your real options? And are you willing to really embrace those options? And you know, a lot of women, when they've been in a relationship for a very long time, they're afraid to leave because maybe they haven't been working. They ha didn't have to, they have to get it back on the job market. They don't know if they have any marketable skills. They don't know if they can pay a house on their own. You know, there's all these fears, but, um, you got to draw a line somewhere. And so then what happens out of fear, the li line keeps getting moved. You know, it's like, well, if he does this, I'll, I'll leave, but then he does it. And it's like, oh, he did it, but I'm afraid. So I'm just gonna, nah, it's okay. I'll just deal with that once. It's okay if he does it once, right? So looking at that, I think is really important. And that's not the same as victim blaming, right? But I'm sure there's gonna be people who listen to this video and gonna be like, Caroline, you're victim blaming. Cause it's, it's, it's when somebody has that mindset that it's either or, it's really hard to hear what I'm saying. It's both. You need to draw the line, no matter how hard that can be. And you need to have that trust in yourself that there's a way forward for you. You gotta have that trust in the world that there's a way forward for you. And you don't have to put up with endless shit just because that's what the other person does. That you can draw that line, right? And that's so, so important. And the anti-victim blaming people, <laughs> let's say, they're very good at pointing that out. Like, yeah, so you gotta, you gotta be mindful of, I mean, cause I've seen this happen. I've seen people very, almost like happily settle into this rut where they, they know that their partner is very narcissistic and they're very happy to endlessly complain about it. But they're not looking at what am I choosing? What am I doing and why, right? And to say that, so, for, to some people saying that you have a choice is victim blaming. I don't think so. I think it's very disempowering to assume that you don't have a choice. You always have a choice. It might be a horrible choice. You know, it might be a choice between two difficult things, but there's always some kind of choice that you have. Like, how are you gonna deal with this? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna put up with? Um, you know, what, what are the choices you're gonna make? And so one of the things I found too is that it can be really, really uh, counterproductive to teach someone healing skills when they haven't first learned to really say and act on their no, when they haven't drawn a line. And that means if somebody is in a, in a relationship with a narcissist, they need to leave, period. I don't care how healed you are. I don't care how happy and loving and whatever you are. That is not a healthy situation, period, right? And that's that line that I'm talking about. And a lot of people will try to fudge that line out of fear because they're afraid to go. They're afraid to, to like, you know, even think about a different kind of life. This is what they know and it's hard, but you know, like better the devil that you know than you don't. So they're just, they just st stay put and try to find ways to just survive the situation. And I think that's very unhealthy. And you need to say, I'm not putting up with this period. And it doesn't mean just saying it. It doesn't mean saying to your partner, Hey, narcissistic partner, I'm not putting up with this. So that, that's not going to do anything, right? You need to act upon that. You need to be willing to go. You need to really go. And so, what I found is that I have, a, I have a program, Noted Narcissist, and when I first started teaching this, I just, anyone who wanted to do the program, who seemed, you know, like they were, seemed like they were highly sensitive and seemed like they would benefit, I let them in, regardless of their home situation. I didn't really ask about that, or even if I did know about it, I didn't think it was necessarily um, a deal breaker. But what I found over time is that when people are still in a relationship with a narcissist, they haven't left yet, they haven't divorced yet. They're still living together or maybe they're separated technically, but they're still living in the same house and like different parts of the house, something like that. Is that that no, that uh, -uh this is not happening, hasn't taken root and maybe it never will. 
And so then if I start to teach someone healing techniques to work on themselves, it does, I mean, it, do, it does, doesn't necessarily, but it can turn into victim blaming for them because they are just like, oh, wait, maybe I don't have to leave. Maybe I don't have to uproot my life and I could just endlessly work on myself. And that's self-blaming. And that's this idea that you can just fix a relationship on your own and it doesn't take involvement of the other person at all, right? You can just try to endlessly please them and do all the right things and just be okay with taking a beating and just find ways to recover every time you do, whether the beating is physical or emotional, just like learning to take it, learning to take it, learning to take it, learning to recover, getting up faster, and then thinking that that is actually a dual plan and then looking for more and more healing tools. That is really, really dangerous. And that does, you know, like I said, it does turn for the person doing this to themselves eventually into victim blaming, because no matter how much I may tell them, you need to get out, this is not healthy. What they're hearing is it's scary to get out. I need to keep working on myself so I can somehow stay afloat in this, in this weird situation. And so now I no longer do that. So now when I know that someone's in a, in a relationship with a narcissist, I tell them, I'm happy to work with you. I'm happy to teach you healing skills, but only after you've left. And some people are really disappointed because, and they'll, you know, they'll say like, okay, well, I'll, I'll try to figure that out. And, you know, maybe I'll come back to you later, but they, they never come back to me because there's something in them that's just doesn't really want to go. And there's endless, endless reasons why, but it's just fear. And, you know, nobody can really, I think, do that, help you with that. Like it needs to be this decision on the inside where you say, enough is enough and I'm leaving. And once you make that decision and you leave your life, like things start rolling again, things become possible again, new options start emerging, new ideas start emerging. Um, and I've seen this happen, you know, with people who left, I had, was a, it was a client. I only spoke to her a few times, but she had a partner who was, she was actually literally afraid he was going to kill her and for good reason. Okay. This was not a random fear. This was a very, very founded fear. She was afraid if I leave him, he's going to try to kill me. So it wasn't just getting out. It was getting out and going incognito and making sure he couldn't find her. And she had uh, health problems. She could only work part-time. Um, she didn't have any savings, right? But she did get out and just through sheer perseverance, she found a job that she could do that she could make enough money to hire an apartment somewhere. And it was like a special arrangement where she could get a discount if she paid a little bit up front. And then, you know, once she knew that she was going to leave, she was trying to squirrel away some money. She made it work, right? But she didn't know that it was going to work until she decided that she was going to leave. And this is the thing, this is the decision. This is the, the hard no that you need to have in these situations. You need to say, I don't care what happened. Like almost, of course you care what happens, but it's almost like, I don't care what happens. This is, this is not okay. And of course you need to be strategic about it. If you're in it, if it's dangerous, obviously, right. If you have, a, if you, if you're with a person who you think is going to do harm to you, you got to be really smart about how you go. I'm not saying that's just, a, I'm not saying to just like uh, blatantly just, get up and leave and whatever. You've got to really prepare that. But there's got to be that inner sense of no, no, this is, this is not okay. I'm not, I'm not putting up with this and put not putting up with it. Also recognizing this person is not going to change. So trying to invest time to get them into therapy and trying to get them to change. It's just a waste of time. You're just giving them more time to change their, change their strategy really to keep you inside, to keep you locked in. Um, so yeah, I think the people who complain about victim blaming, they're very right about this dynamic that you got to be really careful with this because it's so easy for it to turn into, Oh, I'll take all the responsibility and do endless healing work on myself, but out of a deeper fear of saying no and seeing where, where my life could take me instead. But you also can't stay in that place of just endlessly yelling. He's horrible. He's bad. And look at what he did. At some point you also got to look at like what drew, drew me to him or what, you know, drew him to me or however direction you want to, you know, explore that. And then what, what was it that I thought, Hey, this is going to work. What were the red flags that I missed? You know, what are the things I didn't see that I didn't want to see? What, in what way does my view of people in the world need to change? Not in a negative way, you know, not like, Oh, everyone's just a bastard, but in, in a way where you accommodate, Oh, there are like unhealthy people out there. And what, what can I do? What can I do so this doesn't happen again? And that work is very powerful, I think, because otherwise you stay in this place of fear of, 
you know, then suddenly anyone everywhere could just do that to you again. And then you become frozen in place, not moving forward. So the no comes first. First, you need to get to a place yourself where you say, no, enough is enough. I'm leaving. I'm out. I'm not up for this. And then the healing part comes and you need both. You need both to really, to really thrive and to really claim your life. Okay, so I've been talking around this in a few different ways, you know, but, but, but I know it's a complicated topic and I know it's easy to misunderstand. So then I just like to repeat things from a few different angles and helping it sink in, hopefully. Um, if you are, if you were in a relationship with a narcissistic person and you got out and you're like, holy crap, that was just terrible. Like what just, I, I'm so glad I got out, but like, how do I make sure this doesn't happen again? Now it's time for the inner healing. Now it's time for the inner work. And if you like my approach, if you like how I, how I look at things, how I approach things, I have a program called Know the Narcissist where we work on the inner stuff. We work on you know, what was it inside of you that somehow didn't see this coming when you could have seen it coming or when there were signs or what kept you going when you should have stopped, you know. And not again, not to say, you did a, not, not to say you did a bad job, but just looking back saying, oh, you know what? Your inner, your way of living in the world um, can be very suited with a healthy person, but you, not, you need to know that for, with some people, with very unhealthy people, it could get you sucked in, right? And then you need to have ways to recognize that when it's happening. Basically, all the good qualities you have, you gotta have a place where you can limit it. You gotta have a way where you can limit it. You cannot always be understanding. You cannot always be supportive. You gotta have a sense of, wait a minute, now it's getting out of whack. Now it's not okay anymore. And what often happens in a relationship with a narcissist is that all your like relationship qualities and strategies that normally work really well, where you're like, okay, you know, we have a problem, let's talk about it. Like, you know, like let's let's get on the same page. Like all these strategies and ways that normally with a healthy person are perfect, are like really good. With a narcissist, they totally backfire because you're dealing with a totally kind of different kind of person. And so that doesn't mean that your own strategies for relating are wrong, but it does mean they need some tweaking or at least some um, little checking to say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm doing my usual strategy. Is that actually the right strategy here? Is that actually um, the right way to go? And um, if you're very stubborn about it, if you're like, I am always going to be this way no matter what, that can really get you into trouble. You gotta be flexible and say, I'm usually a very nice person, but with these and these and these people, I'm not because if I'm too nice with them, I get into trouble. You know, bad things happen. You've got to develop that flexibility and developing that flexibility. It's not a matter of forcibly changing behaviors. Mostly it's a way it's, it's working on like the inner, inner piece, like the emotions and the beliefs and the patterns the stuff that's really deep down that's driving the behaviors. Because when you can calmly sit and observe what's happening, you can choose how you are going to respond. And your body will help you. Your body will let you know, like, is this a moment to empathize or is this a moment to call bullshit on someone? Right? Your body is actually really smart. But what happens is we learn to override a lot of our body wisdom and we learn to override a lot of our neutral ability to observe when we have spent too much time in a situation where we had to, we felt like we had to act really quickly and, and just respond really quickly um, to keep things afloat, to keep things okay, to smooth things over, you know? So there's, uh, and again, this is gonna sound to some people like victim blaming, but what I see is, you know, there's, there's typically a pattern. Like you have learned when you end up in a relationship with a very narcissistic person and you get in really deep, it's, you know, more often than not, you have learned to relate to people like that previously. It doesn't come out of the blue. You have learned all these adaptation strategies where you just kind of instinctly almost switch into doing what they like and doing what pleases them. But even with all your strategies, you can only get so far. And it's just something I think that, you know, people who grew up in an unsafe and unsafe, emotionally unsafe environment, you learn these strategies. You're like, uh oh, this, like on some level you sense that this is not a safe situation or this is not a safe person and you cannot be honest and you cannot say what you really feel and you gotta like hold that all in and you gotta like do something else. But those strategies take over, right? So what happens with a lot of people in narcissistic relationships is they go in, they're in fear mode and they're in survival mode 
And they're in this mode of, I cannot be myself because it's unsafe to be myself. It's unsafe to be honest. And they're just, all these behaviors are taking over. All these adaptation strategies are taking over. But to the point where you don't realize, it just happens automatically. Because some level you're, you're sensing, like if I, like he's saying something ridiculous now, but if I go against it, he's gonna blow up. So you, all of that, and just just like with under a second, might you might be realizing that, like bing, 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 bing. oh, that's gonna happen. So I just gotta say something pleasing right now to smooth things over and make sure it doesn't blow up, right? Whereas with a healthy person, you would just not do that. But also when you have these habits, they can get so in, just, in, just ingrained that it's really hard to get back to how you really feel and what you really want and what you really want to do, right? So it's in all these different ways, you can end up behaving in, in following automatic patterns that you've learned to survive previously. And then the next narcissist you meet just clicks in right into those patterns really easily. You're like a perfect match, right? Because you've already learned to cope with very difficult people and make it work relatively well. But even with all those skills, it's gonna run out. It's not gonna be enough because, like I explained before in like a different video, it's always your fault anyway. With a narcissistic partner, it's always your fault. And there's always gonna be days and moments when they feel bad. And even when you do everything right, it's still gonna be your fault. Because if you're with them, if you're, if you're the partner, you're with them, you're the one that surrounds, you're the, you're the one that they're, they're gonna blame. When they look around, they look around their little life and they're like, Whoa, who's, whose fault is this that I feel bad? The first person they're gonna see is you, so it's gonna be your fault, right? And, but that, by that point, you might be in so deep, you might be in so deep in this ad adapting and, and changing and adjusting that again, you're convinced, oh, I'm just not adjusting enough. I'm, I'm being selfish if I want, you know, like if I want certain things, that's being selfish. It's, it's, it's not okay to have that or to want that. Um, so yeah, there's all these reasons why, there's all these mechanisms why, there's all these really, when you trace it back, it always makes sense, like why someone ends up in a place where they behave that way. But the thing is, those behaviors that have built up over time and that can kind of take over your life, if you don't look on the inside, if you don't look like at like, okay, what I'm actually doing, what happened, what was I feeling underneath? And that takes some practice, it takes some skills, it takes some know-how, how to do that, what to look for. Um, if you don't do that work, you're just going to just build on top of those patterns and just, just make them even more efficient, which means you're going to be even a better partner to the next narcissist, you know, <laughs> until that blows up at some point. So, um, the healing work involved is really pulling back and unraveling those patterns and unraveling those patterns that made you click really well with the narcissist, which is also why it's, it's, a I wouldn't say impossible, but it's almost impossible to do this work while you're in a relationship with someone who is like that, who is a narcissist, because you're blowing up all the things that make the relationship somewhat doable, right? So trying to truly heal on the inside while in a relationship with an unhealthy, well, emotionally unsafe person is, it's oil and water. It doesn't work. It doesn't mix. Because on one hand, you want to keep everything stable, as stable as possible, as friendly as possible. So all your ad adaptation patterns are on high alert, are on like hyperdrive. But on the other hand, you're trying to heal and undo all those and destroy those patterns and, be, and make the relationship more rocky, which is the result, right? So this, you can't do that when you're in a relationship, which is why this healing needs to happen between relationships. Like okay, so you know this is why you have to do this healing after the relationship, at the end of the relationship, because you need to be in a place where it's okay to blow up those bridges. It's okay to blow up those ways to relate better to narcissists. What you want in the end, what you really want is to be repelling narcissists. That somehow the way you're being and the way that you're interacting and the way that you're true to yourself and the way that you put up boundaries and the way that you just, you know, the way that you, you the way that you live your life is repelling to narcissists. And that does happen. The more you tune into yourself, the more honest you get with what you really want, what you really feel, what your real boundaries are. But obviously you can't do that while you're still trying to make things work with a narcissistic partner. So that, that, that work has got to happen after when you're already out. But it's really important to do that work. Otherwise you're going to be spending the rest of your life 
trying to understand narcissists, being mad at narcissists, being upset at them, instead of taking this as a healing opportunity and saying, oh, you know what? Yes, they're horrible people and they suck, but also why is it that somehow I end up picking them every time? Because there are other people out there, right? And often it's, you know, when people are in, in relationships that are not good, it's like, you're not just in one relationship one time. It's like every single relationship you have in some way ends up in pretty much the same pattern. There is a pattern there, right? And acknowledging that and seeing that is not victim blaming. That's saying, hey, this is interesting. There's a pattern. There's something that I keep doing all the time or something that I allow to happen. You know, maybe I never consciously pick him, but he's picking me and he's trying so hard to win me over and I let it happen. I don't know. Everyone's situation is different, but there's a pattern. This is not the first time this happened. So there's something that I'm missing or something I'm not seeing. And it also doesn't mean that you're going to become like this super, super quick, like figure it all out in five minutes person. It doesn't mean you're going to know in five minutes if someone's a narcissist when you're just pro you're like healed enough. No, they're confusing. They're smart. They can be really, 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 you know, deceiving. Um, but you might say, okay, especially because I'm vulnerable to this, I'm going to take some precautions. I'm going to take my time. I'm not just going, one of the things, for example, is don't just like when you meet someone you like, and you've been together for a few weeks, don't just cancel your, you know, your rents or like give up your place to move in with them. Because if you do that and you turn, it turns out that it, you were wrong, it wasn't so great after all, and you want to leave, you're suddenly stuck. Right? So some of this, um, some of this, this dealing with it afterwards, is also just very practical, like knowing the difference between what are the things that you can know and you can feel and you can sense, when you're really honest, you take your time, you make some time every day to check in with yourself. There's things you can know. There's things you can know when you're just willing to look, you're daring to look. But also there's going to be things that you don't know right away that take time to start seeing. So how do you create that time for yourself? So you don't dive right back into some potentially hazardous situation, right? That, that being realistic. And to, in order to get there often, you know, you have to break down and destroy some of those fairy tales. Some of those fairy tales about he just swept me off my feet and that means it's meant to be. One of the fairy tales that people get really caught up in is this idea of soulmates. This is really dangerous, I think. Maybe there are soulmates, maybe there are not. But the moment you start calling something a soulmate relationship, you're basically throwing all the boundaries out the door. You're saying anything weird that happens, it's because this person is my soulmate. Anything difficult that happens is because this person is my soulmate. You're basically giving the other person a free pass, do whatever they want to you because you're soulmates. This is why I don't like that concept and I don't like people using it. I think if you have a great relationship, you can just call it a great relationship. You don't need to call it a soulmate relationship because I see so many people who are in unhealthy, unstable, dangerous relationships, sometimes emotionally dangerous, right? But they just like their own self-esteem goes down the drain. I see them referring to their partner as their soulmate because it feels so intense. Yeah, it feels so intense because you're on fire and not in a good way, okay? <laughs> so, so, you know, stripping away some of these stories and some of these fairy tales and some of these ideals and some of these like wishful thinking things, it takes time and it takes, it, it takes time, it takes inner work and it's not just a matter of like trying really hard for one day. You got to kind of learn how to do the work and just do a little bit every day or every week, you know, at a pace that's doable and just kind of strip back, what are some of these illusions? What are some of these blind spots? What are some of these assumptions that you had that got you into trouble that need adjusting? You need to make time for that, that's so important. Because then you can, you, know, you can go out, you can date again, you can meet new people and see, okay, where am I at now, right? Who am I attracted to now? And it's gonna be different. It might not be where you wanna be yet, right? It's still, it's, it might be that, okay, now there's a lot of things that you're no longer putting up with and it's much better but there's still some things where you realize, oh, I totally did not see that. I totally missed that and okay. But this is the path. This is the path. It's seeing, okay, like what is clouding your judgment? What is stopping you from seeing? And it's always stuff inside of ourselves. It's patterns, habits, things that take over, stress responses that take over very quickly. And all those things can be dismantled when you know the right techniques and you just take your time to do that work. All right, so I hope this gave you some insight into, you know, like why, yes, victim blaming is wrong, but also the focus on 
victim blaming is wrong can just kind of veer you into the wrong direction. Like either extreme is not helpful. It's not helpful to only look at the inner stuff, but it's also not helpful to only look at all the ways that they're bad and all the ways that you're trying to block them. Uh, because this happens too, there are people who are very good at blocking others, but then what happens is they see one thing they don't like and they're like, oh, I'm just gonna block that relationship, right? Um, or they put up with things for a very long time, they let it happen, let it happen, let it happen, and then they suddenly say, okay, it's, this is too much, and then they just block it without seeing how did I contribute to this dynamic? You know, because if you let somebody do something on and on and on and on and on, you don't say anything about it, you don't do it, you don't stop it, you're teaching someone it's okay to treat you that way. Yeah, I used to be a teacher and in, in teaching, this is the same. We had these groups where it's 12 people groups, usually discussion groups. And what I learned very quickly is that you have to set the right tone from week one. Maybe you can still correct some things in week two, but after that, whatever patterns, whatever ways of you know, dysfunctional ways of being exist in the group are going to stay. Right? So if you've got one person from, you know, who comes in and who's really loud and obnoxious, you got to shut them up with first class. Because if you don't, if you just let it go, you say, maybe they'll stop on their own accord. This is going to be a thing. The rest of the classes, like the, the things settle very, very quickly, right? People kind of, when they, when they're new, when people newly get together, they look at, okay, what is okay here? What is not okay? What's allowed? What's not allowed. And then after a little while, things just kind of settle into a pattern. And so this also happens, you know, one person to another, like if you are letting someone do something without saying anything about it, and then after five months, you're suddenly like, this is not okay. It comes as a surprise to the other person. <laughs> They're like, this is not okay, but like, you never said anything. Like I had no clue that this was not okay. Right? So this is the inner work because the inner work is about learning to recognize sooner also for yourself. Like, wait, this is not okay for me. I don't like this. But you can, you can end up brushing over that out of fear. You can end up going into smoothing things over mode out of fear, out of just automatic, this is how I do life kind of, you know, patterns. And then you can end up in a place where it takes really long to realize, oh, this is how I really feel, right? And so if you, if you have a pattern like that, we're just like letting people do things and after five months you blow up at them and then you just, and then you just kick them out of your life and you do the same thing with the other people, nothing's going to change, right? Because it's how you relate to your own boundaries that needs a little work, needs a little attention. So that in that way too, like a lot can change when you relate to what's going on inside of you in a, in a deeper, in a better way. And there's always deeper and better to go. Okay. It's like that journey is never over. There's always new things to learn about. Oh, why did I do that? And what's really underneath it? And how do I really feel? Um, but when you do that, you know, when you, when you claim that, when you get clear on that, it's no matter what somebody else does, they can't take that away. But if you don't really know what you're feeling, it's very easy to get confused when you're afraid to feel your fear. It's really hard for your body to warn you about diff dangerous situations because your body's going to warn you through the fear. But if you're tuning out the fear, cause you don't like feeling the fear, then every time there's a dangerous situation, your body's going to try to get your attention with fear. You're going to damp it down and you don't get the warning, right? So there's all these ways that your body is ideally set up to protect you and to warn you and that you have the intelligence you need to stay out of unhealthy situations. But there's also a million different ways that you learn to brush that aside and push it down and just, you know, smooth things over. And those habits are the things that get you in trouble. That doesn't mean you'll never be taken in by a narcissist ever again, but it does mean that you'll discover what's going on much, much sooner when you're willing to see things for what they really are. And you're not smoothing it over, telling yourself stories in your head, thinking, Oh, I'm sure it'll be okay. You know? Um, so yeah, there's, that's the inner piece. That's the inner piece. And that is not, it's not saying it's your fault, but it's saying it is, there are things I can work on to make me more resilient and to make sure that I don't get taken in this way again next time. Maybe there's another trick I'll fall for, you know, maybe there's a different trick that I'll have to find out the hard way that I didn't see, but you do make very significant progress this way. And you do end up with, um, situations with people where you feel a lot better about yourself, about your boundaries, about what you put up with, about how you interact. Okay. So this was Caroline from the happy sensitive. Thanks so much for listening. Bye-bye.